All right. Um, welcome everyone to the Spree Seminar. Today we have Lucas Nascimento from uh, the University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. Um, and he's here, he's a PhD student and he's here at UNSW uh, on a short term uh, exchange uh, during his PhD. Uh, and his work is on climate related impacts on PV performance and reliability. And uh, he's been working on uh, Brazilian analysis. And while he's here, he's also going to be looking at some synergies between uh, climate impacts on PV performance and mo aspects of modelling between Brazil and Australia. So thanks very much, Lucas. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Ana. Good afternoon, all. So Ana already introduced myself. My, my name is Lucas Nascimento. Uh, I am from Federal University of Santa Catarina. It's a university in south of Brazil. And my talk today will be PV systems in warm and sunny climate, results from PV installations in Brazil, <coughs> and some synergies with, uh, with Australia. So this research uh, topic is one of the main topics from uh, Photovoltaica Ufski. That's the research center where I'm coming from. So Photovoltaica Ufski is a research training center, and it's uh, working since 97. Uh, with Professor Ricardo Huta, our professor and director. So, a little bit about Brazil. Um, Brazil, since 2012, uh, it starts with his own uh, net metering uh, compensation mechanism. Yeah? So, we uh, are allowed to have systems up to 5 megawatt peak uh, in the roof of our uh, houses in Brazil, and this is working uh, competing with the tariff. This is because it's net metering. Our tariff there will be around around uh, 20 cents of Australian dollar. And we have installed until now 11 mega and our goal is to 2024 to have 1.3 gigawatt in the grid. So what is really driving the market in Brazil? It's the centralized market. So we have three major actions uh, in Brazil. Uh, and this was uh, our three main ones, two, one gigawatt each one. So we expect that until 2018, we, have, we will have three giga in the grid. And up to 2024, the goal is to have seven giga. So Australia, in the other side, this is the news from last week. You reach 4.8 gigawatt of energy in your rooftops. This is more than three times what we are expecting to have in the next eight years. So this is bring to my topic, PV performance. Yeah. So this is not an Australian neighborhood. This is a Japanese one. But let's imagine that uh, you guys are responsible for taking care of all these systems. Not just taking care, but taking care about any OEM maintenance and operation issue regarding uh, the operation of these systems. So you're seeing that most of these systems are looking south, looking north, different tilting angles. So imagining you, if you need to decide that you need to send a maintenance team for this place because one of the systems is underperforming or overperforming. So we need a figure of merit that we can put all these different conditions in the same table. And this figure of merit basically is performance ratio. Yeah, performance ratio basically it's a ratio between real and theoretical performance. And allows you direct comparison be between systems and doesn't matter uh, where they are installed or which kind of uh, configuration they have. So my topic here will be about performance ratio assessments looking into three major points long-term viability, soiling, and modeling inaccuracies. So basically, this is a PV cyst loss diagram over the whole year. Could be uh, a chart from other program. And the main point here is when you are deciding to, to have a PV project, basically, in the first point, you are doing a, a simulation about what should be the performance ratio of the system. You are changing components to see how 
the different components it will affect the performance of the system. Also, you could uh, assess different locations. So let's see how the different locations it will impact the behavior of the system. And then let's say that you really went into it. You really did your PV system, and then you wait one year to see what you are really having on field of your performance ratio. And then my question is, can I really compare my simulation data with my measured data? So these are my, my topics. Yeah? So first, long-term performance. So what I'm showing here is, that, is the irradiance distribution in Florianopolis, where we have our university, over 15 years. So basically what I'm showing in, in this table is that, so let's see the first point. 3.5%. This means that I have 3.5% of energy of irradiation between 0 to 50 watts per square meter. Yeah, in the end of the chart, okay, over 1000 to 1050 watts per square meter, I have 1.3% of the energy. So just have a, have a look in the whole picture. What I'm saying is that you could have year by year, the same energy, the same irradiation. But it's unlikely that the irradiance will be the same year by year. Sometimes you have more cloudy days, sometimes you have more sunny days. And year by year, this irradiance distribution will be different. What's the impacts of that on the system? Basically, we have two major impacts. One of them is regarding PV models. So when you are, using, when you are looking for a PV panel, basically, the PV panel doesn't behave uh, for low light radiation as the same as he's performing under 1000 watts per square meter. This is called weak light response. And different technologies have different responses due to this effect. When you're looking for an inverter, the inverter doesn't have a linear efficiency curve. So sometimes for when the inverter have a really low loading with low irradiation levels, the efficiency of the inverter is not so high when he's over nominal uh, loading. So basically, these two uh, main uh, issues, it will impact the system during your long-term performance and your long-term assessment. Also, one impact here is the temperature. So I'm showing you here 15 years of uh, temperature distribution. And you're seeing that, OK, you have your profile. But for some years, we could have higher summers, like with high temperature. And also, you could have uh, a little bit colder winters. So year by year, the difference between the temperature effects in the PV system will be different. In the end of everything, the impact of all these environmental effects is that I'm assessing here 15 years of performance ratio. And basically, performance ratio are the blue bars here in the left axis. So let's just do a parenthesis here in the first year. So in the first year, I had a performance ratio of 82%. So this is a morphosilicon model, yeah, a morphosilicon system. So in the first year, he is establishing due to the Stable-Vronsky effect. So let's forget just the first year, because he's in the stabilization year, and let's compare the other ones. Basically, what I'm having for the other 14 years is that my average performance ratio was 76%. But my minimum performance ratio was 73, and the maximum was 79. You can see that in the first year, 76. In the second year, a little bit the first year, actually 77, in the second, 76, and then go higher, higher, go down, down. So I had any problem during these 14 years of assessment? None. My radiation cell also being clean every day. So basically, this long-term performance is taking account all these environmental effects that are changing year by year. So. The weather have a so uh, strong correlation with this performance ratio measurements that actually if you want to assess 
a performance ratio correcting uh, your weather data, you should look for other, other figures. And this, if you are interested in, in, on that also, you could have a look in, in, this, in this paper here. This is weather corre corrected performance ratio. And basically, you are, you are doing that. You are taking account all the environmental effects before to assessing uh, your, your system. One point that you didn't saw also in this performance ratio is that was during these 14 years, you, you could see a degradation in this system. Like, could you see a trend of degradation in this performance ratio evaluation? Also not. But the PV system is degrading, yeah. So if we are looking like actually as a PV degradation, what we are seeing is that the system is degrading around 0.55% per year. That's much better than literature, but you cannot see into the performance ratio evaluation. You need to look for other metrics. Soiling also have impact in the seasonal evaluation of the system. So this paper basically is showing that in light gray here, you have soiling losses, and in, in dark here, you have rainfall, daily rainfall. So what you can see is that when it's raining, the system is being cleaned. If you have a long period without rain, the losses are going higher and higher, and if you have just a little bit of rain, the system will be cleaned. So basically, what is Zohil and Casanova are saying is that Soiling could impact the system for sure, but it's just a question of uh, the, seasoning, the seasonal uh, impact of the rainfall into the system. But it's, always, it's not always just like that. This is one system that we have in our campus. And for this system, the rainfall is not just cleaning the system. Basically what I have here is kind of slime mold over the system. And these need manual cleaning. So it's not always a question of rainfall. And for this system, after a manual cleaning, I have a 5% improvement in performance ratio. Compared to Casanova results, Casanova results was about 4% per year. This is high losses in soiling. Yeah? But let's put this 5% uh, of losses into what is really uh, getting uh, impact on my financial assessment. So basically, this system in my, my university, it's being cleaned every two years. For this one, if I wait, if I wait two years to, to clean the system, my tariff cost in Brazil, I told you, was around 20 cents of kilowatt, uh, 20 Australian dollar per kilowatt hour. And this will result in $48 over these two years that I'm not putting in my, my pocket. Yeah, it's money that I'm losing over soiling. My question here is, could you find a qualified worker here to clean your roof for less than $48? I don't think so. Yeah. What I show you also was just homogeneous soiling. But not always is just like this, homogeneous soiling. For some of our evaluation sites, we also are uh, having non-homogeneous soiling. And the non-homogeneous soiling, it's a much stronger impact in the PV system. So for our system, we are having losses from 11% to low 3.5%. Basically, we have two impacts here. One of them is related to the mismatch electrical losses. And the other one is the spectral effects. So just looking into the uh, mismatch losses, this is basically regarding because these models are portrait and they could be landscape. The losses will be much lower. But for the thin film models, they are already, already in, in portrait. And we are having losses from 3.5% for CIGS to 8.2 for amorphous silicon. And the spectrum here, it's what is causing this difference in performance. Basically, the soiling acts as a blue filter. So technologies that have a more blue response will be much more affected. And this is basically is amorphous silicon, cadmium tel, and CIGS, this is more, more red responsive. 
this is going less affected. So a little bit about modeling accuracies. So I show you 15 years of year-by-year -year irradiance measurement. But then I'm doing the average of these 15 years, and this is what I'm having. This is the, irad the average irradiance distribution in Brazil. But when I'm doing a simulation with metanol, uh, PVCs, what I, will see is, what I will see is that the energy distribution is much different. Basically, what I'm seeing is that the synthetic early data from the softwares, they are underestimating over irradiance values. OK, Lucas, this is also is happening here for Australia as well. Jesse and Anna Bruce also uh, work on this comparison here for Australia. And also for a few sites, you could have more strong uh, difference than to the others, but also you could have this difference. We have a lot of um, modeling accuracies in most of PV softwares, yeah? but why I came with this one? Because this one is really important for us. This is one of the main inaccuracies for us. This is why, so I'm showing here uh, the last auction that we have, all the solar farms from Brazil last auction. And what I'm showing is that Brazil, for the last auction, have a system uh, average inverter, inverter sizing factor for all the systems of 120% overload. So this is means that basically I'm having a 1 megawatt inverter, and I'm putting 1.2 megawatt peak of solar PV on this inverter. So basically, for all these systems, if they are being assessed with uh, PVCs or other, other softwares, the modeling is uh, undersizing, is under evaluating the losses that you could have in inverter clipping. And this is a big issue because most of these losses, it will decrease the price of what they are expecting in energy. So in 2012, many of utility companies uh, was aware of all these um, uh, particularities from Brazilian climate and would like to understand a little bit more about how PV would work in the different climatic regions in Brazil. So we started this pro project with uh, 12 uh, utilities. It's a 30 million US dollar project which we are assessing in seven different, uh, in eight different places in Brazil, seven different technologies. What we are calling as evaluation site. So basically, this evaluation site is seven different technologies. Six are fixed. One, are, is, one is a two-axis uh, CPV system. And all the measurements here are taken in a one-second resolution. So these are the eight sites. And you see that they are exactly the same. The same models, the same sizing, the same equipment. Even people who work on the construction of these sites was the same. The only difference is the tilting angle of the systems. Yeah? And we already have some results of these systems, for sure. But as I mentioned in my first topic, I don't have one year of data here. So it's too soon to do any conclusion about all these systems. Also, in the same project, we have a 3 megawatt R&D power plant. And what we are assessing, basically, in this, in this power plant is different electrical topologies. How to build a power plant, a PV power plant. So we are assessing, basically, low voltage wiring, high voltage wiring, central inverters, decentralized inverters. And for these decentralized inverters, these guys here, we are assessing different inverter loading ratios, basically from 80% to 170%. So what I'm doing, I'm having 100, so 17 kilowatt of PV in a 10 kilowatt inverter. And for sure that I will have clipping losses. But the point is, how much the clipping losses will affect my energy? What are my losses on energy regarding this place? And also, what's the impact of the energy losses 
on the levelized cost of energy for all the systems. Also, we need to evaluate this in an annual basis. We are still assessing the data, but this is also something that we are looking. Also in this project, we are seeing some record breaking over irradiance events. So this is basically is known as cloud edge and cloud enhancement effects. And in literature, the maximum value already measured on ground was in this site in Ecuador. 1,832 watts per square meter. And this is 3,400 meters. I've never been there, but for sure no PV system is there. But in this site, we have it, yeah. We have a PV system. This is just five meters above sea level. And we have, we're having 1,822 watts per square meter. So it's the second highest value of irradiance on Earth. I'm not just looking for these quick spikes, I'd like to look for the long ones. And what will be the impact for the long ones in the PV system? So basically, we're having uh, this cloud enhancement facts that could have three, four minutes. And the impact of that on the system will be that the string box, where you have, where, where you have all your fuses, they will be in high temperature because they are operating. This high temperature of the fuse causes a derating factor on the current that this fuse could carry. This plus a longer ev irradiance event of three, four minutes for most of our sites is resulting that most of our fuses in the system are blowing. So basically, if I'm using the fuse that is specified by the manufacturer, the fuse it will blow due to this, to this conjunction yeah. of, of, of phenomena. So we are talking about some manufacturers to do a possible revision about the fuse rate for, the con for these conditions in Brazil. Time resolution is also something that we are looking. So one second resolution for sure, it's nice, but it's a lot of data. So we need a balance, we need a compromise. So what I'm showing is that this is one second resolution. And basically, it's a one sampling. It's a one second sampling. And I'm also integrating this data in one second. But I could do like the same day with a 10 seconds integration time. You see that I didn't lose so much information. I could also do a one minute integration time. Five minutes. 10 minutes, 15, one hour. So basically we'll pass again, just to see the information that we are losing. This is when everything is the same day and the integral of everything will be the same. Yeah, I'm just doing the averaging. You know, one second, 10 seconds, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, one hour. Basically the Brazilian standard, it's 10 minutes. So in red, this is what I'm taking from data for most of my systems. But in blue, what's the reality? Let's assess this in terms of energy. So I also I'm doing here uh, a radiance distribution. And basically, let's look the values of irradiation over 1,200 meters, 1,200 1, uh, uh, watts per square meter. So basically, for one second, I have more than 10% of my energy in this beam. If I'm using a 10 second resolution, this is 9%. One minute, also 9%. Five minutes, five. 10 minutes, nothing. So basically, if I'm using the integration time that our standard is asking, I'm not seeing anything of that. So a good compromise for this data is that one minute, we didn't lose so much. And this is what we are basically using for most of the sites that we are not using one second resolution. OK. This is uh, the G173 reference spectrum. And this is what I'm showing here in this gray curve. 
So basically, when you are assessing a model during a standard condition, 1000 watts per meter, 1.5 ms, the standard spectrum, this is what we are using. But if I'm going to Brazil, Porto Alegre, which is south, south Brazil, basically the same latitude of Sydney. Yeah. This is basically the spectrum that I'm seeing in Porto Alegre in the red curve compared to the blue curve that is the G173 reference spectrum. So what I'm seeing is that I have more red here. I'm sorry, I have more blue. Yeah. I have more blue light in the Brazilian spectrum compared to the reference spectrum. What's the reason for that? So basically, the reference spectrum is not a measure spectrum. Basically, it's a result of a simulation. This is March 2, Gemard and NREL model. And the input data to recreate the standard spectrum is based on ozone, CO2 level, water vapor, and the aerosol optical thickness. This is basically in an average of one year data from US. And the RMS 1.5 basically is the typical RMS from the 48 states from US. So basically, when I'm comparing you, the standard reference spectrum with my Brazilian spectrum, I'm saying that the conditions, the atmospherical conditions from US are different from the atmospherical conditions from Brazil. This is, why, this is the main difference between these two spectrums that I was saying. And what I'm sh showing you next, basically, is an assessment of the spectrum from, from Sydney using your local atmospherical factors. So I'm taking the data from AERS and, and Terra satellite. This is Giovanni uh, portal. And basically, I'm having Sydney less ozone than the average from the standard. 304 Dobson unit compared to 340. For Sydney, I have more water, 1.52 centimeters compared to 1.42 <coughs> water column. Also, my aerosol optical thickness here in, here in Sydney is a little bit higher. It's 0.1 compared to 0.084 from the standard. Also, the CO2 levels, they are rising and rising. They are in a trend of 40, 402 parts per million compared to 370 from the standard. And in the end, the standard spectrum is a 1.5. That's the average from the USA territory comparing to the air mass at noon in Sydney, your optical air mass or your normalized air mass will be 1.32. So all these conjunctions will bring that this will be the typical spectrum for Sydney at noon with the same uh, shape of the Brazilian spectrum with more blue energy compared to the reference spectrum. Basically, and this is a simulated data, we need validation, but I'm saying that we have more blue energy compared to the reference model. And this goes from 300 to around 800 nanometers. I'm comparing here with your uh, perovskite uh, spectrum response. And you can see that basically this is the spectrum response from perovskite cell, from 300 to around 800. And since we have much more energy, the point is that in Brazil and Australia, perovskite cells will perform better than the reference spectrum, and that's what you are really measuring in your lab. So this was my, this is my, sli my last slide, yeah, and I'm open to questions here. Yeah.
Excellent presentation, Lucas. Um, one question. The dynamic um, response of inverted. Uh, could we go back up, actually? Sure. We've got an, an energy loss diagram. It's like a Sankey diagram at the beginning, which came from PV Cyst. I love Sankey diagrams. I think they're so. This one? No. Yeah, the PV Cyst diagram oh, sorry. the losses. Okay, so what you're talking about here are the subsystem losses associated with um, uh, your total gross loss of the system, correct? Yeah, exactly. And this is the PV Cyst Sankey diagram. Have you gone as far as creating an empirical measured loss diagram like this? And before you answer, one, one thing I'm thinking of particularly, yourself and Ralph and people here are working very much on the module impacts, the module losses, degradation, temperature effects, soiling, etc. But what you've talked about today has significant relevance to the balance of system, the power conditioning, the inverter response. And what you showed there at one second suggests that you've got very rapid changes in irradiance. And from memory, the IEC standard for response of an inverter to a rate of change of irradiance is 200 watts per square meter per second, right? So are you evaluating, first of all, the fault typologies of inverters and other balance of systems. What faults are happening when? How often? How, when are they tripping? How long are they tripping for? You've mentioned your fuses. And secondly, are you correlating them not just to your maximum irradiance events, but the dynamics of the rate of change of irradiance? Because obviously that's an area which is very poorly understood and potentially has significance with regard to your work. Yeah, for sure. Two good points, yeah. Um, so basically, the chart with real measure data we have for our, so this system that I'm showing, this 15 years uh, performance assessment. So we have a chart for our system, let's say our empirical data, with, um, with the data that we have from inverter. And also, this is one topic that we are looking into this um, with this project with our 12 facilities. Besides the, the results from inverter, we also have redundancies like in the string box and also redundancies for the energy meter after the inverter. And what we're having is that, uh, for sure, if you are assessing data with inverter data or if you are assessing data with a much more precise equipment, the difference will be much higher. Yeah, so basically, I have a chart for that with data measured by the inverter. And if I'm comparing with data for our systems, which I have like uh, a more, uh, a more uh, better equipment, I'm having different results. Yeah. So much of these charts, uh, let's say that are much more related sometimes to the inaccuracies of the equipment also. And I cannot just state that this is the true because sometimes the uncertainties of my equipment are higher than Absolutely. the values that I'm having here. So if I was to ask you, just for, for very quickly, if I was to ask you, do, should we be concentrating on reducing losses from modules, or should we be concentrating on reducing losses from balance of system, especially inverters, what would be your answer? Yeah, for sure, um, the, the inverter here is not a question of the equipment, but how you are assessing your system. Yeah? Basically, the sizing that most of people are doing in Brazil, uh, we have much of our losses regarding uh, losses on inverter. So this is basically a, a sizing issue. But also looking into model, what we are really having is losses on a, a model caused by soiling that are bringing some companies to assess different coatings for some of these places that we that I show you that you have non-homogeneous non-homogeneous soiling. So basically our first solar is assessing different coatings for this for these places to improve the soiling the soiling losses since we don't have water in these places. Yeah. And this is much more uh, similar to your outback climate here. So for sure like I think equally both are important, yeah. So the way are doing sizing, but also the models. Thanks. 
so the presentation of course. You showed an example of um, an inverter, almost 70% oversized to mm -hmm. the um, PV. And you also shown the clipping and associated losses. So um, is there likely to be a standard in Brazil or regulation to advise the installers or um, utilities or companies to size the inverters, um, taking those sort of things into account? I see. We, we don't have, we don't have it. Uh, basically, it's a decision made on uh, economical assessment. Yeah, so you are uh, overloading your inverter to the point that your, your, your economical assessment makes sense. And basically, this is what is driving people to have these systems that are around 130, 120 um, inverter loading. We don't have it yet, but for sure that uh, as outcome of this project would be s nice to to have a standard of maximum values for these main regions which we are assessing the project um, i have a question you have mentioned to clean the solar panels in your experiment um, however have you considered to clean the inverters fans because this this has a great effect on the coolings and the efficiency conversions, especially after three or four years, the, the fans might get uh, stopped by the dusts. Uh, I'm not sure if Brazil is a very dusty environment, and I believe those inverters are outdoor environment uh, protection uh, devices. So it's quite important to think about those efficiency loss in terms of the inverter side. Sure. So basically, uh these all, all evaluation sites, uh, they are using uh, decentralized inverters. So these are the 10 kilowatt, 10 kilowatt ones. And for these ones, this is passive cooling. We don't have actually a fan. And this was one main topic to, to choose actually, like between the brands, this model of inverter. Yeah, uh, a passive cooling inverter. But for the central inverters, we, we have it. Yeah, we have it. And as this is a central inverter, uh, normally during night, people are doing that. Yeah? And this is the nice part about PV systems. Yeah? So you could have maintenance every, every night. Yeah? So since most of these uh, systems that they are in the backyard of big hydroelectric power plants, people that are taking care of the maintenance of the hydroelectrics also are taking care uh, of our systems. Good. Oh, okay, so. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lucas. We're really looking forward to um, exploring more the synergies between Australia and Brazil. And although we don't have the, the same kind of experimental setup that you have, we still um, have some scope to explore uh, some of the synergies with our irradiance data, for instance. So, looking thank you. forward to that. Um, thanks very much.